So for the first lecture of the second day, we are happy to have Laura Donay, and she will continue to talk about uh, celestial amplitudes. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Recording in progress. Um, so yeah, we will keep uh, keep uh, exploring this topic of the infrastructure of gravity in flat space times. Uh, let me start by um, summarizing the main uh, point that we saw yesterday in the first lecture. So yesterday I tried to uh, present the, re the rich fact that the symmetries of asymptotically flat spacetime are way bigger than the ones of, of Minkowski. asymptotically flat spacetimes, and we saw a precise ansatz for the metric which is asymptotically flat as one approaches uh, the boundary, the null boundary of future null infinity. So the symmetry of exactly flat spacetime are given by the Poincaré group, which consists of four translation and six Lorentz transformations. Now the symmetry group of asymptotic flat spacetime is an infinite dimensional enhancement of, of Poincaré, given by an infinite amount of what people have been calling super translations, which are spanned by this arbitrary function of the angles t, which comes in these new components of the infinitesimal vector field. And similarly, there is a sense in which we can enhance the Lorentz part of the Poincaré group to an infinite amount of super rotations. Uh, spanned by um, conformal killing vectors. So we have two copies of them in this complex coordinates, uh, y, which is, depends only on z, and y bar, which depends only on z bar. So these are conformal, local conformal killing vector on the sphere. Okay? So this is uh, what is known as the extended BMS group. Extended because in the first place, Bondi, Messner, and Sachs only found these super translations, but now people thought it was a good idea to extend uh, the Lorentz part to also an infinite amount of symmetries because in, in conformal field theory, we are very used to, have, uh, to having this uh, Vera Zoro type of symmetries. So this is what we saw uh, yesterday. And today, uh, I want to tell you basically on the importance of these symmetries for the scattering problem in, in flat spacetime by showing you that these symmetries uh, provide an infinite amount of conservation loss for the S matrix. And so this is the relation we will start looking at with the BMS and the S matrix. So uh, this is uh, a result due to Strominger, which is now already ten, a bit less than 10 years ago. Um, so the result can be uh, stated as follows. BMS symmetries imply an infinite amount of conservation laws which constrain strongly scattering amplitudes mass of massless particles in flat space time. So the original references for, for these papers. And uh, to show that, of course, I will not have time to go into the details of all the steps required for establishing such a correspondent, which is a, a neat mathematical statement. 
But I, I want to tell you what are the two main ingredients you need uh, in order to achieve this. So the, the first ingredient is given by um, BMS charges. So, so far I, I've been telling you about symmetries, but as you know uh, from Noether's theorem, when you have a symmetry, there is a conserved quantity associated to it, uh, and the BMS charges are nothing but the, the Noether charges associated to these Uh, asymptotic symmetries to so the BMS, of course, asymptotic symmetries. So you might, I mean, actually, this topic of building uh, charges associated to asymptotic symmetries is a whole topic on its own in, in GR. So it could be a lecture just, just about that. There, there are many uh, techniques involved which uh, Trace back to the work of Wald and Wald and Zupas and other people in the, in the 90s. Uh, it's known as the covariant phase space formalism. If you are interested in knowing how uh, building these charges, uh, I would refer you to uh, this uh, PhD thesis, which, uh, which I think contains the most accurate uh, and state-of-the-art uh, prescription for BMS charges. But let me just uh, give you one result, uh, what, what a discharge is for a super translation. So I will denote by QT, the charge associated to super translation symmetry. And this is just taking this simple form. So. where um, it's basically a pairing between this function of super translations and, uh, and the uh, mass. You remember this M was the bondy mass aspect that enters into this one over uh, our expansion around the flat space. And this integral is over the sphere located at the past of the future of null infinity. So I will have to define this because I don't think I did it last time. So you remember we had this null boundary, future of null infinity, scribe plus, which was parameterized by retarded time u and, and coordinates. Now if I take u goes to minus infinity, I arrive here at the past of future null infinity. And similarly, we had, uh, I mean, I didn't present the things in, in, in um, advanced coordinates, but as Francesco was asking, there is all these stories also valid for incoming uh, particles. And in this case, everything is labeled in terms of this advanced time, V, which is T plus R and taking uh, V goes to plus infinity, you land on this location, which people denote by scribe minus plus. So it's the future of the past boundary. Here. So V goes to plus infinity. Okay, so Yesterday, I've been writing everything in terms of just one component of this boundary, in terms of a scribe plus. And um, so strictly speaking, I have defined for you a one copy of the BMS group living on the future. So I will denote by, with a plus, uh, yes, the coming, uh, the charge living uh, on, means meaning on future null infinity. Uh, hi, uh, one question. Uh, what is the qualitative difference between the uh, past of uh, the future null infinity or 
future of the past null infinity and the special infinity i0. Yes. So we'll come to that, but so i0 is here. And on this diagram, it looks like they are the same thing. But actually, it's just an artifact of this Penrose diagram. Actually, these locations are infinitely far away. So, and actually, more precisely, spatial infinity is not included into the conformal compactified space-time. So this is actually a very important point, and I will come back to it right now, uh, about how do you basically, uh, what happens when you cross this uh, spatial infinity. But yes, yeah, spatial infinity is not, neither sky plus minus, neither sky minus. Not at the limit point of uh, this uh, Yeah, it's, it's strictly speaking, it's, I could not even draw it mm -hmm. here in this diagram. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So we ha I have t told you about BMS here on the future, but there is another copy of BMS symmetries on the past. And this charge will denote the, the BMS charge living on the future, but there is also, um, there exists also uh, a, a, a charge living now on scry minus plus. So that's the first ingredient, is the actually to be able to uh, construct these charges. And now you, you probably see where I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that in order to define the scattering uh, problem in flat space time, we need to know how um, how uh, um, the, the quantities that are defined at the past are related to the one uh, living in the future. So in order to make this statement uh, true and actually to uncover that BMS symmetries provide you a symmetry of the S matrix, a fundamental ingredient, and this is, I think the lack of observation of, of this statement was because uh, no one, nobody really realized what we needed to do to match these two, two disconnected pieces. And Strominger proposed that there is a precise way uh, to map the quantity of the uh, space-time from the past to the future through a so-called antipodal matching uh, at, antipodal matching at, at I0, but let's just call it antipodal matching. So this antipodal matching uh, will give us a junction condition for a gravitational scattering problem. Again, I'm focusing on massless scattering, which is needed uh, to relate the in, in incoming states uh, to the outgoing states. So without such a matching, you cannot talk about scattering, basically. So what is this uh, antipodal condition? Well, antipodal in the, just in the sense that we will re relate quantities um, on the celestial sphere as cry uh, minus plus with the one at the antipodal point of the sphere as cry plus minus. So to do that, um, you can consider, you remember I used these uh, ZZ bar coordinates. So a, a convenient choice for these co coordinates is to say that a point Z and Z bar, a co the coordinate ZZ bar will represent a point theta phi on sky plus or uh, at the antipodal point pi minus theta pi plus pi on scry minus. 
So this is just a, a, a way to choose my coordinates here uh, in such a way that when I will give you a ZZ bar, it will either represent a point on scribe plus or the antipodally uh, related point uh, on the past. This is just a way, it's just, it's just a, a, a con uh, if you want a choice for these uh, coordinates that will make this antipodal matching uh, way easier to write down because now basically uh, this coordinate system implements uh, naturally this antipodal relationship. So what it means is that so the, the condition that we will impose is that the bondy mass uh, aspect, so it also depends on, on you, evaluated at uh, scribe plus minus, will be equated to, well, okay, u, u goes to minus infinity, so I will not write it down because it's not a function of u anymore, strictly speaking, on, on this location, will be equated to the sphere, uh, to the, the corner uh, at square minus plus. So that's the antipodal matching condition we will impose. And it's really crucial um, because not only without that uh, you cannot make this uh, statement about this metric, you cannot make any sense out of that. Uh, and second, we will see that this condition is actually the one needed um, and very natural to, to, to a certain amount of extent. For instance, you can see that this CP, uh, is PT and Lorentz uh, invariant and there have been a, a long um, literature in general relativity about this, uh, this sort of matching condition. So it's a very difficult problem to see in general uh, how the field will behave when you take u goes to minus infinity. Uh, it's, a, it's a delicate problem in GR and how they evolve from the past to the future. Um, so, yes, yes. So in general, M is uh, different before the limit. So you have M U Z Z bar uh, on a square plus and some M tilde V Z Z bar and then on in the limit you do this change. Or the, the functional the function as a function of U and V is supposed to be somehow related. So why you use the same symbol, so to say? Yes, very good. So indeed in, in principle, uh, this M the M here is this one of our R term is in the GVV components of an expansion of BMS type at square minus. Uh, so in principle, these are two un un unrelated quantities. But now, indeed, I, uh, I'm making the, the claim that if you want, yes, this in principle would be a different function. But now I'm identifying this function at, this, uh, at these corners. So is there a physical intuition between uh, why you want this condition? Like, I understand maybe the math gets better, but. Uh. Yes, I mean, you can, you can see that uh, if you have, if you are a non-interactive particle and you, you enter the space time from the past infinity, you will cross, uh, you will cross the, the sphere at scribe plus at the antipodal relation. That's somehow uh, natural in this sense. But it's, it's a really non-trivial statement about the structure of, of the space-time, which is, so I want to emphasize that this thing is, uh, yeah, has not been fully proven, but it's, it's, it's proven in a, at posteriori when we will see that it's equivalent to the Weinberg's of theorems, so it gives a proof a posteriori that this matching should hold. Uh, sorry, yeah. maybe you also mentioned that this is a, it seems that it is an artifact of the Penrose diagram that these two uh, places are the same, no? But they are not the same. No, they are not. Yeah, okay, yeah. so for other quantities, uh, this matching is not true? Um, other quantities, what you have in mind, like other... The, the other terms. terms in the expansion, for example. Yes, yes. So I will actually, I will also uh, impose this matching on the other uh, function 
here I'm doing everything for a super translation, so this will be enough. But it's, it also matches, uh, remember this angular momentum aspect we saw yesterday, this will also be matched. And also the, the shear, this gravitational shear will also uh, be required to obey a similar antipodal condition. Okay, but so if you match all the quantities uh, there, uh, it is not like if you are uh, imposing that these two places are the same. If you, you can analytically continue all the, all the function uh, in uh, I zero. So it seems like you are identifying these two. So these quantities are not strictly speaking defined at I zero. This, there there okay. was an expansion over, uh, around the null hypersurface and if you want to give me a data on like your people do on the, some kind of time like Cauchy slice, you will have to do a total and you want to describe an asymptotic a, a expansion around a spatial infinity, you will have to resort to a totally different gauge and, and stuff. So these are a lot of work by Friedrich and other people where you have to resolve a space like infinity by Either you can put a system of coordinate and foliate it by hyperbola, or you can use another gauge where, where, you, where you foliate it by, where you describe I0 as a cylinder. There are many ways to do that, but there are really different uh, expansion around I0. And since I would be interested in massless scattering anyway, no massless particle goes there, so it's, uh, we will not need to do that for the purpose of this lecture. But it's an interesting story, and people have been looking at BMS symmetries around uh, I zero. Okay. So now that we have this um, matching on the phase space, um, so I'm just—I will not enter into much details, but I'm actually restricting myself to a certain class of space-times, which are the so-called christodoulou kleiner mine kind of space-times, which obey uh, certain co conditions. I don't want to go into too much technicalities about that, uh, but if you're interested about the assumptions behind this, uh, just you can ask me uh, at, the, at the break or during the discussion. So the, the, this antipodal condition will uh, break uh, the combined BMS plus, so in principle we have two copies of the symmetry, one living at the future, one at the past, the BMS plus and BMS minus action, which act in principle independently on the future and the past. Uh, it will break it down uh, to uh, a diagonal subgroup Uh, that preserves this antipodal condition. So but basically what he will amount to do is it will amount now to identify the super translation uh, parameter at the, at the past of the future with the one at the future of the past. So again, in principle, as Marco was making a point, this T function is in principle a very different uh, function, but now I'm, I, if I want to preserve this matching, I will, it will induce this, uh, uh, this uh, choice, which basically uh, fixes uh, one frame in terms of one other. And so we have this uh, symmetry matching now, as we are going through uh, around I zero. And now we can put the two ingredients together to show immediately that what will this matching will amount to do is it will amount to equate uh, the BMS charge uh, at the future and at the past, which is the statement that the energy is conserved, this we know, but now the super translation enhancement is telling us that the energy is conserved at every angle. And the quantum version of this uh, equality is a wild identity. So the world identity 
associated to super translation symmetry. is the statement, so if it's a symmetry, it should uh, commute with the S matrix. So this will be the form of the word identity that is implied by a super translation symmetry. And and uh, I will tell you briefly how you can see that this word identity is actually nothing but a very well-known theorem in quantum field theory, which is uh, Weinberg soft graviton, where soft graviton is uh, a graviton whose energy is taken to zero. So I will present the main uh, things we need to, in order to, to show this sort of uh, statement by um, getting at a more defined, uh, more affinated um, definition of massless scattering in flat space where I will introduce the things that we are more used to now in quantum field theory uh, with uh, uh, free fields, creation, annihilation operators, and, and most of the work to show these identities are actually translate these two languages, the language of general relativity and asymptotic symmetry and charges with the one of the qu quantum field theory uh, that we are more used to. Is there any question on this uh, conservation? Uh, yes. Um, the reason that uh, we don't need this condition for simple flat space scattering is this that m is zero or is there something else? Because uh, I think there's a discussion in Weinberg's book about matching the uh, generators of Lorentz group in the for the inner state and outer states. Is it related to this? Uh, so the first part of your question. No, no, no. Keep the microphone because I'm not sure I understood the question. Uh, you, you ask about zero, what is zero if, if this thing doesn't hold, what? The, the quantity M, the bonding mass. Yes, so what's the question is whether this holds? I what mean, the, this condition uh, is trivial for simple flat space scattering. I mean, why, why we don't bother to talk about oh, this? Oh, yeah, 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 no, because we are, we are interested into, you know, this uh, asymptotic flat space, uh, phase space with the, uh, and how this bondy mass, I mean, Weinberg doesn't care, I guess, in the, the bondy mass aspect and the angular momentum. It's just a different point of view. I mean, it's just really two communities talking different languages and working in a different setup uh, that never came into the realization that they were actually describing the same physics in different ways. Yeah. So. Let's, let's go to, uh, to massless scattering in flat space. If there is another question, just interrupt me. So um, I will uh, sometimes, okay, I will write down very fast. Somet now I will be using, I mean, usually we, we are using not Bondi coordinates, but Cartesian coordinates. And I just want to write for you how these two things are related to each other. It's just a simple change of coordinates, but again, most of the work has to do with translating things into one other. So this is just a change of coordinates from Cartesian to this Bondi coordinate I used yesterday. And this maps the, to the line element we had yesterday. Uh, 
with gamma ZZ bar, the round sphere metric. So a massless particle uh, of energy omega will uh, cross the celestial sphere, the S, at a point. Um, so now I will use a different notation, but it's not different notation. I will use different letters to, di to, to distinguish the, the, the coordinates Z and Z bar and the, the one, the coordinates that label the um, momenta of the particle, but this W, W bar, not to be confused the omega with the, with the W, so I hope this will not lead to confusion, but you have, um, you can parameterize the four null momenta of the particle, C mu. So, the on shell massless particle, like so, where om omega time Q mu, where Q mu is a null vector, uh, which can be parameterized like so in terms of this uh, angle W and W bar. So this parametrization is not unique, of course, but this is very convenient when we want to match things with Bondi because you can see, when you see how you go from Cartesian to Bondi coordinates, this parametrization looks not so, not so crazy. And this, the particles, uh, so I will be talking about spin one and also spin two particles, mostly about gravitons, but they have, they can be, have a polarization vector, epsilon mu, with a plus denoting positive helicity. which in, in terms of this null vector parametrization for Q can be taken to take this form. And similarly, uh, for negative helicity, epsilon minus you can write it like so. So you can check that these guys satisfy these relations. So they are suitable polarization vectors, normalized like this. And okay, very good. So this is just mostly introducing notation. So what is important is that we have massless particles, they have an on-shell momenta, and I can write Instead of writing P mu, I can write everything in terms of three numbers, omega the energy and the point W and W bar at which the particle will cross the celestial sphere. So this is the most very natural um, thing to do. And now we will want to talk about, um, let's take mass um, scattering of a gravitational field. So at late times, the, gravitation, uh, the graviton will become free and can be approximated by the mode expansion that I guess you're all familiar with. So I'm considering an outgoing graviton, which is at very, very late time is free, and this is the usual textbook formula that you can find, but I have to write down just to introduce uh, my conventions and notations, where you have the usual creation and annihilation operators, exponential of i to, I to the P dot x, where x are the Cartesian coordinates. And you have a sum over 
the two helicities, plus and minus, labeled by this alpha, A out dagger, E to the minus I P dot X. And now we have a polarization tensor. It can be plus or minus helicity, which is we're choosing a gauge so that it can be written as epsilon mu times epsilon nu. And A out and A out dagger satisfy the usual um, commutation relations. Write it fast. The prime dagger is delta alpha AB times two omega, omega is P zero, two pi cube delta three of P minus P prime. Okay, so I'm, guess, I'm guessing you, you have seen this expression before and now the thing we will, the main thing we have to do is we have to express this expression, well express this tautological. You have to write down this expression in Bondi coordinates, u or z z bar. And take a large radius expansion if we want to match it with the BMS asymptotic expansion that I wrote yesterday. And then what you can uh, show is that it will take the following form. So remember that what I introduced yesterday, this shear function, so this, that this encodes the two uh, polarization modes of the graviton, was the piece in the ZZ bar components of the metric So to extract it, I need to take the perturbation H, divide by R, and take the limit as R goes to infinity of this quantity. So this is just a definition. Now it's, it's an operator. You see, I have uh, operator uh, representation for, for this object in terms of creation and annihilation of gravitons fields, uh, gravitons. And so this is a definition if you want, but it will match, it will be identified with the shear in the BMS expansion. <clears throat> and now you need to do this business, write down H in Bondi and take the large R limit. And there is a little computation to do that uh, I will not review here. I'm just writing the result, minus A minus out. This depends on omega, that's bar. You have a dagger and you have exponential E omega U. <coughs> so to obtain this, there is, um, you see, you need to write this in, in Bondi coordinates and take the large R, so they will be, um, a rapidly oscillating phase uh, in this exponential, you need to take um, stationary phase space approximation that will uh, localize this exponential. And it's done in detail in the exercise uh, in the book of Andy Strominger that I've written the reference yesterday, this uh, Strominger lecture note. You can see uh, the detail in in these exercises. But the important thing I want to emphasize on is that doing this large R expansion will localize um, uh, the, the point, the direction in momenta at, on the celestial sphere. So you see before I had, I made the distinction between the ZZ bar coordinates of, this, of a point in space time 
and the point WW bar at which the particle is pointing towards the celestial sphere. Now, I'm doing this large R expansion, these two angles will be identified. So I have only uh, now something that will depend. So omega and omega bar have been identified to Z and Z bar. So this is the, this little computation that, that does this. It's just saying that we are identifying the point on the celestial sphere with the particle courses, uh, scribe, scribe plus and scribe, well here I'm talking about outgoing states so of scribe plus. So I can pause here, take if there is some question on the notations or on what we are doing. Sorry, Laura, a very elementary confusion. So in, uh, typically when we have uh, particle states, uh, we take, uh, uh, say, a graviton with a definite uh, momentum. So here uh, we are integrating over this energy. So um, what, what is the relation with the usual particle states? Can you repeat again? Uh, so here I'm integrating over, um, yes, if you want, this is the, expressing uh, the state in a direct or position space, which is related to the momentum space by a Fourier transform. So it's, it's uh, because you see we are, so basically this is basically a Fourier transform which inverts the, the energy with the, with the time because I, I need to map, precisely I need to express this in this basis to map it, map it with the Bondi, Bondi story. But the state is going to be, say, eigenstate of a uh, boost, or what? The associated states will be an eigenstate of boost, or? Um, so the associated state, uh, so usually, um, let's see, yes, so usually they would be, in, if I were in the position, uh, in the uh, usual uh, momentum, a space, there will be uh, energy uh, eigenstates. Now, if you want, there are the Fourier transform of that. So they will, they will, uh, the transformation will be a bit, the, 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 the thing that they will diagonalize will be a little bit, bit different. So then I, eventually I will go to an, another basis. I will not stay very long in this U basis, if you want. I will go into the celestial basis where thing will uh, transform nicely under uh, boost and Lorentz transformations. So yeah, it might be a bit unfam uh, not not familiar to write to write the, the graviton mode uh, like so. But precisely, we <laughs> most of the things to establish the connection between these these two topics is precisely to sometimes go to some bases which are not so conventional from one point or the other. And at the end, I will go to a different, a totally different basis. Thank you. Hope it clarifies uh, the things. So this is for a graviton, and you have an analogous um, expression for a spin one particle. Um, let me, yes, I mean it's it's very similar, but in case you are you you prefer that, so. Um, well, okay, I, will, I, will, I think I'm running out of time, so I will, not, I will not write that, but basically you have a similar expression for gauge field, a mu, so the z components of that, and I'm selecting the leading piece in the large R expansion which now a uh, normal fall off for a gauge field is to start with r to the power zero. And in them, except that here instead of epsi eps the, you will have epsilon uh, uh, z instead of z z. z, z. Uh, yes, maybe I should say what this, this hat here is one of r square times this epsilon. I have defined uh, here. <coughs> and here the, well, okay. 
So this is, so what what is this expression means? Again, to to reiterate. So let me call this expression one. So here you will really have the same expression. You can find it into uh, Andy's book where epsilon hat is epsilon z divided by r. The powers are a bit different than from gravity, but okay, so let me write some words. So these are, this will define for us boundary operator living on, on scry. So these two operators, one and two, what they do is they annihilate a positive helicity uh, where is this stuff? Ah, okay. Graviton or photon. Graviton for expression one photon for expression two, and they create a negative, so outgoing. Graviton or photon at the retarded time u and at the point Z, Z bar on the celestial sphere. Okay, so here uh, you have C, Z, Z, so we describe uh, one helicity, uh, but you have an, a similar expression for C, Z bar, Z bar, with some, uh, some details change about the, for the, the, the polarization and so on and so forth. So that's this Makes sense, I hope. So this, this we have a sort of a boundary operator that lives in, in this null um, hyper, hyper surface. And now what I will tell you is that um, the zero mode of the field strength associated to these boundary operators, once inserted into the, the S matrix, actually uh, leads to this universal formula known as Weinberg's theorem. I will not have time to review in details uh, some theorems. I will just sketch a very schematic way what these are. Good. So, So this trace back to the 60s also. So it's funny to notice that it was at the same time that Bondi, Messner, and Zach did their, their work. One Berg on his side was, was uh, studying the infrared structure of scattering elements, and other people like Lowe, Burnett, Gelman, and others. So a soft theorem is a statement about S matrix, which involves um, a soft particle. So um, let me just sketch what these are, and you can uh, go into the Weinberg's literature if you want to uh, know more on that. So it's basically saying that you have a scattering process involving a certain amount of particles, which all carry uh, a momenta. And you uh, add to this process a soft graviton, or soft photon, but let me uh, focus on gravity, which will, put momenta will be written like this, just, I'm calling just k mu. 
now in the limit where the energy of the of this uh, soft guy is taking to to zero these things will uh, this amplitude will factorize and will be given by uh, the same amplitude but now without the soft one times a number and this number is called a soft factor so roughly speaking you have an amplitude with n particles. So these particles, which are not soft, are sometimes called hard. This amplitude uh, will factorize as omega goes to zero. And like so, where S zero is the factor let me write down what this this factor is um, for gravity as zero so it's just just a number which only involves the momentum of the hard particle and a pole, Weinberg's pole. So importantly, <coughs> this pole goes like omega to the minus one. And this eta here is just plus or minus, just plus one if the particle is outgoing and minus one incoming <clears throat> so this theorem um, is meant is is called universal because the form of the of the of this amplitude factorization doesn't depend on the nature of the other hard particle remarkably there is a sort of universality into this formula it holds uh, for gravity but also for uh, scattering uh, of photons and also uh, of gluons. There is a soft photon theorem, a soft uh, gluon theorem. The form of the factors are, of course, different, but uh, very similar. And now uh, I can, in the last five minutes, I can basically tell you the main conclusion that I wanted to get at is that the BMS symmetries, this word identity that I've written before, once we do this dictionary between Bondi and, and Weinberg, uh, they are ex exactly the same, uh, the same statement. So I will just this will serve as a sort of a review and this it will amount, it will help me to, to also extend what I've been presenting to other cases. Just a summary table. So we have this word identity. If you remember, this was the statement that the uh, S matrix commutes with the super translation charge. So what am I trying to say? So we have a graviton. We take this uh, the Z bar component, we read of the shear out of that. And then yesterday we saw that the asymptotic symmetry of uh, flat space Include support translations. Psi t by du. There are super rotations. Psi y, yz dz plus yz bar dz bar. 
And the thing I'm claiming and that Strominger and others proved in a rigorous way is that this wire identity associated to symmetries gives this Weinberg sub theorem. So the leading is the one I have written here which contains a pole in the energy. I will come back to, to, to the subleading story in a moment. But before that, let me just say that if you have a photon, you make a similar expansion here as cry. You have now uh, the gauge version um, analog of these uh, symmetries, which what people call a large gauge symmetry, uh, which basically changes the field like so, where the epsilon is an arbitrary function of the angle, and the war identity associated to that is now, not surprisingly, the leading soft photon theorem, which also goes like omega to the minus one. And how you do that, well, is actually the realization that this is implementing, implemented by inserting, inserting in this matrix uh, some currents so in for super translation. There is this so-called super translation current which gives the following. So this, I'm just rewriting here the word identity. So if you insert this current into this matrix, it will take the following form. Um, there is an analogous story here. Let me just write everything and then I will explain a little bit more. So I'm just trying to collect um, a lot of statements and then we will see later that in the celestial uh, holography prob program, these currents will be uh, implemented in a very natural way. Let me just mention this subleading story. So what I Remarkably, what people uh, found is that they knew that there was this super rotation symmetry, and then they thought, okay, it seems that there is a identity between why uh, there is a relation between symmetries and soft theorem. So why don't we look for uh, the extra term into this expansion? So it's an expansion in in omega where now this subleading sub factor doesn't go like one over omega, but now like omega to the zero. And Cacciasso and Strominger found that indeed the, there is a, a theorem, a soft theorem associated to super rotations, which now uh, is subleading compared to the one with the Weinberg pole, but that exists. And uh, remarkably, this these, uh, these uh, statement can be implemented to through an insertion of an object which looks like a stress tensor. And the realization that there was so basically that this wire identity was equivalent to inserting a current on the celestial sphere, uh, which has the, exactly the right dimension to be a stress tensor in a conformal field theory, was what I think really kicked, uh, uh, kicked off the celestial holography program when people realized that there was something transforming like a stress tensor and they thought, ah, okay, maybe, uh, maybe we, uh, 
we can dig uh, better into the conformal field theory structure of, of, of a flat space, and we will find uh, some constraint on, on the holographic nature of, of flat space times by identifying uh, more of these currents. So I, will, I, I know I was quite fast on that, so I will stop here and take any question uh, you might have. Thanks.